This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and today is Wednesday, and that means it's time for another MTG Top 10. In some episodes of this series, I give my picks for the worst cards in a particular category, and that's what we're doing today with a look at the worst cards that are legal in Pioneer. Most of my worst lists end up being dominated by really old cards because in Magic's early days, they very frequently designed cards that didn't do anything or actively hurt you. In order to avoid another list dominated by those types of cards, I thought it would be interesting to look at cards from a particular format. I've already done this once before with a look at the worst cards in Standard, and this time we're going to take a look at Pioneer legal cards. In Pioneer, only cards from Return to Ravnica forward are legal, so we're really only looking at the last 10 years of the game. On the whole, we'll see that the worst cards in Pioneer have a much higher floor than cards on most worst lists, even though the cards on this list are awful. It's just much rarer these days for them to design cards that do absolutely nothing. As usual, for a card to end up on a worst list, it has to be bad in all three of Magic's main play modes, those being Limited, 60-card Constructed Formats, and EDH. It also has to have been bad since the day it debuted. In other words, for a card to truly be considered one of the worst in a category, it has to be bad everywhere and for all of its history. All right, let's dive in with a look at my picks for the 10 worst cards that are legal in Pioneer. At number 10, I have Keeper of the Cadence. This starts out as a 5-mana 2-5, which is a horrible stat line, and it has an activated ability that is both overcosted and fairly weak. There are times where it matters, either because you can use it to hate on your opponent's graveyard or because you use it to keep yourself from milling out. You can even use it to let yourself draw whatever card you want every turn if your deck is out of cards. Those are definitely several situations where that ability matters, but... Those situations all come up an extremely low percentage of the time and certainly don't make a 5-mana 2-5 worth running in any format. At number 9, I have Flame Cast Wheel. This 1-mana artifact is a removal spell, but it is incredibly inefficient. You end up spending a total of 6 mana to do 3 damage to a creature. In other words, you will almost always spend more mana than your opponent did to cast whatever it is you kill, and you probably have to use up an entire turn just to do three damage to something. That is absolutely miserable, and the fact it can't also hit players or planeswalkers is just silly. It still wouldn't be good even if it could do that, but come on, this thing needs some additional upside to even be remotely playable. At number 8, I have Leyline Phantom. The Phantom offers a fairly efficient 5-mana five 5-5 five five body, but it comes with an effect that is almost entirely downside. When it does combat damage to anything, you return it to your hand. Most of the time, it isn't going to be worth doing combat damage to something with the Phantom, because doing so means you're going to have to shell out 5 mana all over again. The Phantom was supposed to be in this limited format to help enable cards with Evolve, since it could keep growing them and keep coming into play, but even with that mechanic around, it just wasn't worth playing. I wish it had at least some minor effect when it entered the battlefield, like even Scry 1 or something would have made it a lot more interesting. In the end, I'd much rather have a vanilla 5-mana five 5-5 five five than Leyline Phantom, even in a format with Evolve. At number 7, it is Tireless Missionaries. A 5-mana 2-3 is a miserable stat line, so it better have some really good effect. But of course it's on this list, so it doesn't. It gains you 3 life when it enters the battlefield, and that is far too meager of an effect for this to ever be worth playing. I remember seeing this as the last card in many booster packs in M15 drafts, and that's definitely where it belonged. It's very difficult to ever feel like you're getting your mana's worth of value, or even enough value back to make up for using a card. At number 6, I have Merfolk of the Depths. This 6 mana 4-2 comes with Flash, and, and that's it. Obviously, the base stats are just awful, and Flash does little to make up for that. The best you can usually hope for is flashing this in and trading it for something, but I can almost guarantee you're going to take a huge tempo hit when you do that. Your opponent will virtually always pay a lot less mana than you do to trade with this, either because they're losing a 2-2 or they use a 1-mana removal spell. Like the Phantom from earlier, Merfolk of the Depths was sort of intended to work well with the Evolve mechanic in Gate Crash by being something you could flash in and grow all of your Evolve creatures, but Merfolk of the Depths ended up being too inefficient to ever be a good enabler. 
At number five, I've got two cards, Mardu Blazebringer and Runaway Carriage. I included them together because they have such similar designs. Both of them are efficient creatures that get sacrificed at the end of combat when they attack or block. The Blazebringer is a three mana 4-4, four, four, and the Carriage is a four mana 5-6 with Trample. Unfortunately, even as good as those stat lines are, the downside is just too much. Sure, they can attack reasonably well one time, but that isn't worth going down a card. Additionally, your opponent can tack into these with anything, knowing that any block you make is going to be ugly, so even just using these to trade for something can be a challenge. The Blazebringer was sort of meant to support the Ferocious mechanic in its limited format, but again, this is another card that was supposed to be an enabler that ended up being too inefficient to ever be something you actually wanted to play. These would both be better cards if they were less efficient and didn't have this huge downside. At number four, I have Structural Collapse. This six mana sorcery makes your opponent sacrifice an artifact and a land, and it does two damage to them. That does mean Structural Collapse can produce a two for one, but there are a few problems here. First, not all opponents will have an artifact when you cast this, and if this is six mana to destroy a land, it is miserable. And even if they do have both a land and an artifact around, the fact it is an edict-like effect means your opponent can always make a decision where this has a minimal effect, especially because you aren't casting this until the mid to late game, at which point they are even more likely to have expendable resources to sacrifice. Basically, no matter what this card does, it will never deliver a two-for-one that actually helps you, and you just spent a ton of mana to impact the board in an incredibly minimal fashion. At number three, I have Font of Ire. This is a two-man enchantment, and you can pay three generic and a red to do five damage to a player. In the end, you spend six mana for the effect, which makes this a worse version of Lava Axe in most ways. And it isn't like Lava Axe is exactly a model of efficiency. You do get to pay an installment, so you can actually fire this off at four mana, but the total mana you spent does matter. Effects that only damage the opponent always have some problems, mostly because they don't actually affect the board or even impact the game unless they do enough to finish off your opponent, and that only lines up a very narrow percentage of the time. When it doesn't take out your opponent, you end up going down a card, and when your opponent uses their mana to actually add to the board and build an advantage, you're going to end up way behind. Even in Theros block, where enchantments really mattered, this wasn't worth playing. At number two, I have Providence, which is bad for the same reason Font of Ire is bad. They do have very different effects, of course. Providence gains you life instead of damaging your opponent. For seven mana, it can set your life total to 26, and it also has the bonus effect of raising your life total to 26 if it's in your opening hand. That effect is obviously bad in Commander since it would actually lower your life to go to 26 in that format, but in 60 card formats that effect isn't very meaningful either. Setting your life total to 26 later in the game can be kind of a nice effect, but just gaining a bunch of life usually isn't worth this much mana. Even if you do pull this off and gain the maximum 25 life, the fact you spent your turn doing that means there's a good chance you're still going to lose when your opponent's turn comes around. You basically only delay the inevitable, instead of actually dealing with whatever problem got your life so low in the first place. And at number one, I have Search the City. This five mana enchantment exiles the top five cards of your library when it enters the battlefield. Then if you play a card with the same name as one of those exiled cards, you get that exiled card into your hand. And when you get rid of that last exiled card, you get an extra turn. Obviously, the ceiling here is super high. It can effectively draw you five extra cards and eventually give you an extra turn. That would definitely be worth five mana. The problem is, actually having this lineup to deliver anything close to that amount of value is difficult. Obviously, in EDH, this card is especially bad because in a singleton format, it's very difficult to ever gain access to the cards it exiles. It does count basic lands, and if you're playing something like Persistent Petitioners, it can be kind of funny, but even in a deck like that, Search the City is incredibly slow at actually delivering any value at all. So, spending five mana and a card on Search the City is a horrible plan. This is all true in 60 card formats too, of course, even though it will be easier to get the cards off of Search the City. Search the City is too clunky and too slow and should never be played in any format. So those are my picks for the 10 worst Pioneer legal cards in Magic. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to catch up on past videos, including many more where I look at the worst cards in the game, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly.
Lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting me and the channel, you can do so by becoming a channel member or a patron. You can find ways to do both of those things in the description. Thanks for watching.